yeah, Skeep. Uh, basically, we actually do a lot of things more in South Carolina, kind of like this, often where we sort of didn't educate the educators. Uh, and the emergency managers, uh, emergency managers of South Carolina know a lot about hurricanes. That's our most common natural hazard. But we remind them about earthquakes. We also hold teacher workshops uh, in South Carolina for earthquake education. Um, so we we'll talk about basically, you know, what exactly a little bit did the 1886 earthquake do? Um, a lot of people ask me, well, when are we going to get another one? Right? They always want to know when the next earthquake is going to be. Talk about how we know something about earthquakes reoccurrence in South Carolina. And what we'll often most focus at is what's going to happen next time. And I'll uh, actually go down to New Zealand again. I guess where's Danielle sitting? Talk about uh, New Zealand. Uh, turns out a good model for what might happen, in, not just in Charleston, but anywhere in the southeast struck by a big earthquake would be happen in the Christchurch area. The geology is actually fairly similar. Uh, so first and foremost, here is an intensity map of the 1886 earthquake. Uh, actually, I'd like to ask how many people felt the Virginia earthquake in 2011? Probably a few people. Um, that was a 5.8, and that was felt over a really large swath of the eastern United States. Uh, this one is felt over an even larger area. This is what we believe is about magnitude 7. Uh, we didn't have seismometers at the time, so we we're trying to guesstimate from the size of the area it was felt. Uh, in addition to being felt in the US, actually felt in Bermuda and Cuba, places off the map. And I like to tell people, it's really not that Charleston is the epicenter, but it was a place called Somerville, about uh, 20 miles, 30 kilometers up the road inland. So that highest intensity of 10 is actually was a pretty predominantly rural area. Uh, in 1886, a town of about 1,500 people. It's about 50,000 people there now. It's kind of part of the outlying suburbs of Charleston, uh, but fell pretty much over a much larger area uh, of the eastern US than the one that we just had. What did it do? Well, in Charleston, it pretty much creamed every brick building to one degree or another. There were some um, of the more well-built, um, on the more stable ground buildings that were in pretty good shape. They had just a minor amount of repair, but pretty much everything uh, that was brick that was damaged. Uh, this is the Edmonton Alston House on East Battery. This is kind of one of those houses you pay to tour today down in the historic part of Charleston. Uh, notice these very large cracks in the wall. The parapet on the top here is completely collapsed. There was a nice um, uh, porch out there that you could go stand out that got taken out by all that falling brick. Uh, they have since repaired it, um, filled in the holes of the brick. But if you go today, and we'll actually take you by uh, this place here, this is on the College of Charleston campus on Glebe Street, you will notice this discoloration between the windows. Uh, that's the brick, repaired brickwork right, that they had to repair after the earthquake. And what they did on many of these buildings is you're looking at these outside patris plates that are connected to metal rods that go through the building, kind of help hold it together. right? And there's an argument over quite how well these will work in the next earthquake. We actually used something similar in new, some buildings in New Zealand that we're investigating from their recent earthquakes over the past years uh, with some of the preservation engineers in town. But when you walk through Charleston, you'll find a lot of these earthquake bolts. These repairs helped repair the building after 1886. And if you look for places either where there's discoloration in the brick showing it's been remortared, particularly between the windows, or if they plastered the building, you'll see cracks popping out of the plaster because once you break something, it never quite go back together and things continue to settle and shift. You'll see this pattern of cracks uh, in the building. And you'll see some of these uh, on the walking tour. And we actually, Charleston has kept, you know, how, Norm, how many would you say? A couple thousand, perhaps, yeah. of these damaged buildings are part of the quaint historic charm of Charleston are earthquake damaged buildings. Um, not all of them survived. Um, this is, was the main police station uh, in 1886 at the corner of Broad and Meeting Street. I just threw this one in. Uh, this is now the post office, the main post office in Charleston. We were very fortunate here in Charleston in that photography, while well, seismometers didn't occur, uh, hadn't been invented yet, photography existed before 1886. Someone had already done a picture book of Charleston 
in 1883 captured many of the predominant public buildings. And of course, then a photographer went out, pretty much stood in close to the same place and took the same picture. So we actually compare before and after. As the engineers love to see this. Uh, and we're using to kind of investigate what happened to the buildings here in Charleston in 1886. So we do the earthquake walking tour. We'll be looking at a lot of those buildings and looking at a lot of the damage that you can see. And of course, you know, we still have the photographs of even some buildings that were torn down and not rebuilt afterwards. Another big thing that we'll see uh, tomorrow, another big thing that happened in the more rural areas was this phenomenon called liquefaction. The Virginia earthquake, um, it lasts what, two, oh, a year and a half ago now, uh, did occur more in the Piedmont area uh, of Virginia. They don't have a lot of coastal plain sediments there. So they didn't see, uh, there's a couple little places I think they found a little bit of liquefaction. Yeah. Tiny, cool. tiny amounts and some creek beds. Um, on the coastal plain, those nice coastal plain sediments Scott talked about earlier, if they're sandy and wet, they turn into quicksand. And a lot of these layers that turn into quicksand were buried in the ground as the weight of the overlying layers kind of settled in on this now fluid sand layer that came up through cracks in the ground and you had these sand geysers that in the aftermath left these sand blow craters in the ground. Uh, the white here is the sand that ejected out of the crater. The railroad tracks right here pretty much run past the current airport that many of you flew in on, I presume, those of you who flew. Um, <clears throat> So this was a rural area in 1886. It is now suburban Charleston. So a lot of this area is now inhabited. There were very few houses in these places. And one of the things we find when digging in the ground here, this is actually at a colonial town site um, a, a bit uh, to the west from this location. And I'll kind of give you some markers here. This sort of gray-red area in here would have been the original ground surface. This is the sand that would have come out of a hole like this and then later as the rain washes it back in it kind of fills in. Often a sort of a martini shaped, uh, martini glass shape pile of sand kind of filtering into a point. It's a little hard to see but that's the vent in that area there that the sand would have come up through the ground. Um, this is, oh, I didn't have anything in for here. Um, we're probably, it's about a meter deep at that location, if I remember. Unfortunately, we cannot see this site because the archaeologists made us fill the trench back in. Like, yeah, they, they, they're not really interested in that. And one of the reasons why is <clears throat> um, this particular sand blow here, uh, Pradeep Talwani at USC got some organic material out of it and dated it to approximately 1500 BC. Right? Uh, and we knew actually when we first dug it up that it was pre-1886 because that gray layer, that's the archaeology layer where the town site artifacts exist that the archaeologists are interested in. The town was put there in 1697, so this had to predate since it's below. The, uh, the 1697 layer had to predate 1886. It turns out it was around. And there are a few other sites in the low country of South Carolina we find from about the same age. Um, what we actually do is if you dig up these in various places and you can date them, you find they occur all around the same time in certain swaths of time, which date uh, large earthquakes that produce things like this to roughly every three to 800 years in the Charleston area. Average, you know, 550 or so. So these really big ones that leave, in, and there were thousands of these after 1886 across the landscape. Many photographs were taken of them. Uh, the really big ones occur that sort of 500 year time span. Um, smaller ones, though, we generally know in earthquakes occur more frequently. We don't quite know um, how often those occur, uh, sort of the, what I call the medium ones. Um, and what I like to do these days, you know, people know, you know, what, the, what about the next time? What will it look like? Well, we have the photographs from 1886, but we also have more recent earthquakes that look a lot like it. And I remember this particular New Zealand press photo that showed up sort of the day after the Christchurch uh, New Zealand earthquake. Again, about a seven. It was about, what, 40 kilometers outside of Christchurch approximately, maybe a little further than the one outside of uh, uh, 
uh, Charleston in 1886, but the same pattern of, I call this out of plane masonry wall failure, that's what the engineers call it, was seen in downtown Christchurch in the masonry buildings that we see here in Charleston in 1886. So it's a good model. Um, in fact, I actually have a version of this photo uh, where it's kind of in the sepia tone uh, that I actually like to show sometimes just to kind of make it look more like the, the old photograph of Charleston. Uh, in addition, they had lots and lots of liquefaction. Um, and the thing people don't think about a lot is the amount of infrastructure, not that we just have on the ground surface, that we have buried. Where does your water come from that goes into your tap? And where does it go when you flush the toilet? Right? There's this whole pipe system underground. And when you have areas that have liquefaction, those pipes are going to move and they're going to break. Right? So one of the things uh, I like to point out to people is that what you would expect, since many of these liquefaction areas in 1886 were more rural, they didn't have pipe systems in the ground, you didn't see that impact. Um, these days, we'll have a lot of people without water and without sewer for who knows how long it takes to repair it. Uh, and one thing I discovered because of the multiple aftershocks uh, in Christchurch, this sort of thing, so here's a street, you see all the silt, in this case it was more of a gray sand and silt that came out of the ground instead of white. You see flooding due to the water pipes breaking underground. They actually gave up on about 8,000 properties, whole sort of subdivisions were so liquefiable materials, they actually abandoned them um, in that area. So I kind of show this to my emergency managers and planners around here, and they kind of go, whoa, you know, how are we going to deal with something like that uh, if it happens again here? <clears throat> and a little thing here, Norm's going to probably say more about this sort of thing here. I like to point out the earthquake that did most of the damage to Christchurch was not a seven, but an aftershock that was a six. When we do our sort of research on the impacts of future earthquakes in Charleston, we find, oh yeah, a uh, 6.3 would take out at least moderate damage to 120 bridges, port and airport facilities, uh, break, have 25 leaks and seven breaks in portable, you know, and, and many also in wastewater pipelines. So our pipelines would, parts of them would take it on the chin pretty hard. So. Christchurch is kind of a really good model, even on the medium-sized earthquake, what I like to call the medium one, to what might happen here. And here's my last one here, and they continue. Right? We always have, in the Somerville area, uh, we're down here in Charleston, you see the star is closer to a place called Somerville, continual drumbeat of small earthquakes uh, every year. This is the last felt event, it was a 2.8 uh, in that area back in July. Um, you know, we'll have clusters where we'll have you know, one every couple of months, then it'll go quiet for about a year, half a year, come up again, uh, sort of a, a semi-random occurrence, but we continue to have earthquakes here in this area. So it's definitely still an active uh, fault zone area.